Good evening, I'm Ernie Manus. Tonight, we go back in time to visit with some of your favorite local television personalities from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. From daytime talk to evening news, right through into late night TV, we'll learn the real stories of these classic local shows from the people who lived them. Please join me in welcoming back to the small screen the star of 1970s Boo Theater, but you probably better remember him from the 1980s Captain Harold's Theater of the Sky, Captain Harold himself, Harold Gunn. He spent 33 years on Channel 2's news desk, many of them with his partner, TV legend Ron Stone, weatherman extraordinaire, Doug Johnson. From the greats to the near greats, everyone was a star on the Warner Roberts show. With a heart as big as Texas, please welcome Warner Roberts. From 1977 to 1991, she co-hosted the number one local morning show in America, which beat all the national competition. From Good Morning Houston, Jan Glenn. And from 1978 to 1986, he brought the performing arts into our homes as the host of Channel 8's The Green Room, Jim Bernhard. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we start, remember, you can join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag ACOTV. But enough from us. Let's hear from them. Welcome to all of you guys. Well, thank, thank you, you for having and us. Thanks going, for remembering. <laughs> yeah. Remember, you great. can't forget. You tell people we're doing this show, and the warmth that came out of the audience about having you folks back on television was just great to hear. I wonder, how often do you all still get recognized and people still think your shows are on the air? I still have bumper stickers <laughs> I put out. <laughs> you did? Yeah. I, I was just telling Doug, I, I met a woman about five years ago who said she loved my show. And I said, well, thank you very much. It had been off the air since 1986. Mm -hmm. She said, I watch it every week. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard it so much and heard it so much when I went off and, you know, years passed that I, I don't say it anymore. I don't say that I'm not on anymore. <laughs> I just say thank you so much. It means so much to me. That's, that's better than saying, please put me back on <laughs> <laughs> when all of you folks were growing up, did you have a desire to be on television? I'll start with Jan on that. Actually, I didn't. I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be a ballet dancer. But I was, I was raised on a farm, so there weren't a lot of opportunities to do that. Clogging. But I just kind of clogging. This guy, this is going to be fun. Uh, I actually started as a weather girl in Lubbock until the tornadoes blew the town away, and then they fired me. So, so we that's kind of the that way story. That hold on, hold on. You're not going to skip by that that fast. <laughs> so you're giving that the weather, Cass, <laughs> and you tell the people what? I'm sorry, say that again? You were giving the weather, and your, yes. the, your infamous toward the end last weather cast. Yes. And you tell everybody what? Well, I tell everybody it's daylight savings time in 1970. Go out and enjoy this day. It's going to be gorgeous. <laughs> and before I got back to my apartment at Texas Tech, the, the clouds rolled in, the hail rolled in, seven tornadoes hit the city that night. And I'd say, I said go to the golf course. And uh, 16 people got killed at the golf course. Oh. And so, oh. so it's not a funny story and a not a funny ending because I did get fired that night. And they decided, rather than a little girl who used to be a Texas Tech cheerleader doing the weather, they really needed somebody with a little bit more authority like <laughs> Doug Johnson, who I'm sure has never gotten anything wrong. Well, I never our, killed anybody. Or Doug, yeah. Brown. <laughs> Doug Brown's here and Ed Brandon. You know, they all got it right. And he's right. He has never killed anybody. No. But I did. So wow. that's why you never see me as a weather girl in Houston. So what made you decide to stay in television, though? Well, I took a detour to HISD teaching. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Spring Branch and became a producer out there for their ITV department. And then Jim Masucci at Channel 13 saw my tape from Spring Branch, and he said, I think you'd be good with Don Nelson. And that's how that happened. Yeah, wonderful. So just that fell into it. 
Doug, always always interested in weather? Actually, I can't say that. Well, weather, yes, but you were talking about television. There was no television when I was growing up, so I could <laughs> had no aspirations in that line. It's um, It didn't come around until I was later in life. Well, you started I'm, with Marconi. Unlike the rest of you, <laughs> yes. But we had radio, yeah. and I remember you listening to Fred Nahas all the time when uh, I was a little kid, and did. Paul Berlin, too. I was a little kid when he started. Well, teenager, anyway. Um, no, I originally was in radio, and uh, it was an accident that I got into television because when Colonel Harris hired me to come down from Alaska to Houston, uh, he asked for a videotape. And we'd never heard of that in Alaska. <laughs> there was no videotape. <laughs> so uh, I showed it to the owner of the station. He said, it looks like a typographical error to me, so I ignored it. And came down, worked in radio for about three or four months before it went into television. As it turned out, and I used to do some lecturing at the University of Houston about in, the, in radio, TV, and communication. And they said, well, how did you plan your career? And I said, I never did. It was just a series of fortunate accidents. I minored in meteorology in college. And then when I came to Channel 2, Jerry Peterson was there. And Jerry Peterson got hired off to Chicago. And I filled his shoes about three months after I got there. And loved every minute of it ever since. So I love accidents. He's yeah. still giggling. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and Jim, yeah, this wasn't on your career yeah, path. Like Doug, I grew up with radio with my ear glued to the old floor model Philco, listening to the Lone Ranger and Hop Harrigan and Captain Midnight. And I always wanted to be the announcer on those programs. But my career took a different track. I went into newspaper business when I was out of college and, uh, and then into the performing arts management field. And it was... Uh, there that I was in 1978 when a producer here at Channel 8, Liz Catterley, oh. called me to uh, replace the late, great uh, uh, Bill Hardy, who at that time was doing The Green Room, had done it for a year or two, and he went on to do something else, and I took over from him in 78. And Finally if, got into the, the medium. If I remember correctly, that was a pretty big successful show for Channel 8. Oh, he sure. was on the air for almost 10 years, I think, including Bill's... Uh, period and my period and uh, we even made the Nielsen ratings right. a couple of times yes yeah <laughs> wow that's big which was pretty good for a local <laughs> show that's right. big. for local shows it's, uh, mm -hmm. and the times have changed when it comes to local programming and what they do but I want to finish off first Warner aspirations for television always just wanted to be in the spotlight really <laughs> but was standing what a surprise. But it was a little uh, a little detour I was standing at the elevator at Neiman's and someone came up and thought I was the model at this time, I was really young, taking uh, night courses here at the University of Houston. And I thought, model, I can do that. I'm tall, I'm skinny. At that time, I was skinny. <laughs> and uh, so that led me into a wonderful career in modeling that lasted quite some time. But I was all, always taking classes, always on television, because there were local shows like Steve Edwards. I was always asked to be on that show. And then I began to co-host that show. And Ron Stone invited me to co-host a show with him. So those were the beginnings, and I always wanted a show. Yes, I did. Always, always wanted a show. Wanted a show on television. I did. <laughs> okay, Captain Harold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a whole bunch of different stuff that you've done. Yeah. People will remember you as Captain Harold. But always on and always in trouble. In fact, it's, uh, <laughs> this is the first time they've allowed me back on this campus because I hold the scholastic probation record. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here at the University of Houston, uh, but I, you know, always around. Uh, it started in the background at first. Though, I was uh, producing rock bands, messing around. Always found myself on microphone, though. Enjoyed it. I was a radio operator in the army, but uh, having lunch at a friend's house, uh, late John Wilson, his dad, J. Bob Wilson was a big time ad man here in Houston, Darcy Advertising at the time, and he said, "Kid, you ought to do commercials." And the light went on, and I just started knocking on agency doors, going, "I, I did voices, but not." not like John Wayne, but characters, and I started doing character voices. Uh, and I wound up kind of rewriting, and I said, wait, I write, knock on doors. You know, then I started directing myself. I direct, I produce, blah, blah, blah. Did a lot of that, but I had the late night thing, the Captain Harold thing in the back of my head for a long time. And for people who are not familiar, it was a movie host program. Correct, basically. yeah, movie host, skits and blackouts. I, I was uh, uh, lucky to have so many friends in the biz, Chuck Scott, who's one of them here, but it was a therapy session for disc jockeys here in Houston. <laughs> uh, and we do skits and blackouts, a lot of commercial parodies and so on. But, but Jim Ross was my hero, Dirty Jim, oh, yeah. who started on K-Gull Television doing it by himself. And Jim would do anything. They broadcast out of the Prudential Building. As an example, one afternoon he went out uh, on Holcomb directing traffic in his underwear. <laughs> Had every cable in the building to get these big studio cameras out there. But I was in drama in Lamar uh, with the great uh, Ruth Denny. Uh, and Caroline Ross was one of my classmates, and I knew Jim and had been involved in some productions with him and stuff. 
And uh, quite simply, I was killed in a car wreck in 73, and uh, months of recouping, and I kept churning this idea around in my head, and when I got mobile again, uh, we started Captain Harold Theater. Yeah. And 25 years it ran, off and on. In fact, every station in town except 13. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, actually, I think we have a clip of it, so they're going to pull up oh, that great. clip oh, and uh, see what we've got. Do we have the clip ready in there? Not yet. They're going to have the clip ready in a minute. Because, see, not a lot's changed. You yeah. mentioned, though, the remotes while they're getting that queued up, Jim. I was reading about how Green Room used to go to the openings of shows. You guys went out we, and did remotes live. We did an occasion for the opening of Houston Grand Opera, Houston Ballet, Jones Hall, things like that. Mostly we were in the studio, not this beautiful studio, but the, <laughs> the old Channel 8 studio over on Cullen Boulevard. But the live shows were really incredible productions. I must say, we'd sort of take over the lobby of Jones Hall or the theater that we were covering and uh, uh, go from there. It was a wonderful event. Well, speaking about going from there, Captain, we have your clip. Oh, oh, boy. <laughs> Let's take a look. You do that. Hi, gang. Hi, Hi Captain Harold. Harold. You love what you do. That's what. I'm sorry, I missed that. Anyway, Boy Tonight is one of my favorites. Sweet Lies is exciting. It's from Western International. And, of course, the stars, to be announced. You know, they're, they're in all my favorite movies. <laughs> to be announced. I don't wrote understand. This. Why can't we have a romantic cultured movie like Manhattan? By golly, you hit the nail on the head because the second feature tonight is Manhattan with Woody Allen and Diane Keaton. How about something that's got, like, <laughs> space men in it? Well, by goodness, you're in luck because after that, our third feature tonight is Killers from Outer Space. So we're going to run real quick through Sweet Lies starring the everybody to be announced, but we're going to get to that right after this word from our sponsor. Something for everybody. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> Casting was a, a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, but that, the, uh, the the silly one there is, is Walter Hamrick, dear friend, while he's, uh, while he's still in the business, uh, great disc jockey and, and, and time salesman. But I had great people, uh, the late, great Ed Geldart was our Marvin Medler character. Uh, I'm sorry Joanne wasn't here today. We had our Joanne Ping uh, character. Uh, uh, Dewey Compost, Joe Bauer did that, a takeoff on Dewey Compton. Uh, and the neat thing about it, uh, and of course Marvin Medler, because uh, Zendler was a dear friend of mine. I, I rode with Marvin when he was a sheriff. I mean, I knew Marvin forever. Uh, and we were not beyond slapstick. We choked rubber chickens. We did anything for a gag. But I used to let people come on and pie the person that was parodying them. And Joanne was the only one that would say, I just can't do that. I just can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> come on. No, I just can't do that. Yeah. Zindler loved it. He hit Ed about five times. Take it again. Yeah. Wham. Yeah. Well, Joanne Herring, Joanne King Herring yeah. from the Joanne King Show was going to be with us today. She was feeling a little under the weather, so we wish her a swift recovery. But that's why she's not joining us on the panel. You mentioned rubber chicken, but there are other chickens. There are great animal stories that come with you folks. So I'm going over to Doug on an animal oh, story. Oh, I know the one. We're talking about predicting the weather yes. and chickens. So radar the weather dog, nothing new. No, no. no. Oh, no, that's an old thing. Yes. It's, uh, Ron Stone thought of millions of things through the years that would make my life miserable. <laughs> and he always thought that I needed help with the weather. And Wilma the weather chicken was one of his uh, inventions. Actually, it was invented by... Uh, uh, an FAA organization, gave him this chicken to bring to the station, and he presented it to me on the 5 o'clock show. And uh, he told me to open up the lid, take the chicken out, and it would peck food from the bowl, indicating the weather for the next day. We had a bowl called partly cloudy, one called cloudy, and one called clear. <laughs> so I reach in to grab the chicken, and, and I've seen chickens before. I was uh, spent some time on the farm up in Franklin, Texas, uh, but I never seen a chicken like this one before. It looked more like a cross between a buzzard and a dove, and it bit me as I was taking it out. And I and I enjoy sympathy, so I wore a big bandage to work the next day. Anyway, I set the chicken down, and it took off. It didn't peck from any of the bowls, but flew up into the rafters after it landed on Bill Orell's desk and <laughs> defecated, and uh, and then did various other things. But it stayed in the rafters for. Uh, probably a week until they hired uh, a wrangler to come out and get it. Well, and you know what? You talk about that, and we have, I do believe, some of that footage. Oh, I didn't think anything <laughs> oh, like that was left. Oh, we found that footage. There's a few other things there. This is what we think is a blooper reel that was provided by your old station. Here, let's take a look and see if we've got that chicken. Our lives were destined to cross. It was during the same week, over 30 years ago, we moved into the same neighborhood. We didn't know True. it at the time. Uh, that was over in Westbury. As soon as we found out, we both moved. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but we've had a lot of good times together. Let's look at some of the outtakes and the bloopers oh, no. and some of the collections that we've saved up all these years. Are you from? No, but the chicken's frightened me. No, she's not. Get off the cake. <laughs> 
You want the chickens on the cake? Get her off my seat, if you don't mind. <laughs> let, let her sit on war else. It's too late. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Wilma, we have one minute. What do you think about the weather for tomorrow, Wilma? <laughs> Wilma? <laughs> Come on now, let, this is serious. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh. I think the weather is going to is going to be. Oh. All these youngsters, all these youngsters out there, want to promise from you that it's going to snow for Christmas Day. So let's have a forecast right now. The rats won't snow for Christmas. The rats won't snow for Christmas. It will snow Christmas. You heard it first, but right not here. Here. It won't snow here. Yes, it will. <laughs> <laughs> if you own a car, <laughs> listen up. Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out! No, I'm just Get out of here! Go on! Go on! I'm just driving my own car. I know you are! La da da, Nettie! Lord have mercy on such as we! Ba, ba, ba! <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did we call those Heard outtakes. outtakes but none of those were outtakes. I was just to say no, those just, actually That's aired. all in the air. Yeah. Oh my God. That <laughs> was the evening news when you were around. I huh? would say uh, we very we got very little news out. Is what we did. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's better. I mean, better. <laughs> what, a, what a clown Stoney was. I mean, he was oh, a great was singer. Oh, Do yeah. you know that he could really sing? Yeah. We sang many times together. He was a great yeah. singer. We did one of our best. We were doing a, a takeoff on these schools where you're supposed to take your kids and get them straightened out. And I had this girl in a dominatrix outfit and this cat of nine tails. <laughs> and somebody's going, Stoney's in the editing bay. And she goes down the, the aisle. Everybody in the newsroom is going nuts looking at her. And she goes down and she slides the door open. And she goes whoop with his whip. She looks at Stone and she says, "Are you been real bad?" Yeah. And, she, and Stoney goes, "Oh yes." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we were talking. I'm going to pull us back for a minute onto animal stories. Okay. And Jan, if I'm not mistaken, you have one about a snake. Yes, I do. And you know, Doug's here today. And Rob Landis, who was our house band, the Rob Landis Trio. And I don't know if Rob was there that day, but Doug certainly remembers this. We always had the Houston Zoo about once a month, and they would, the one thing we didn't want, we didn't want a snake in the building because we were all scared of snakes. So, of course, they, they brought a snake. And the snake got loose and got underneath the set, just like this, under the kitchen island, and it stayed there for a whole week. And you could hear it while we were interviewing oh, no. guests. We knew it was there, but the guests didn't know that it was there. And it took about a week before we finally got it out of there. But, but you mentioned something about the chicken. There's something about these bright lights. Oh, yeah. You get an animal under these lights, and they want to relieve themselves. <laughs> they start getting hot or something. We've had steers in the, in the Good Morning Houston studio. We've had turkeys had problems with turkeys, and of course the crew always has to clean all that up yeah. after we would leave, after the show was over. And some of them would say, it's not in my job description, I'm not going to do I mean, that. That's more the show than the lights. <laughs> oh, I don't know that you all heard that comment. We'll just move on. We had an elephant, I have to just oh, say. No. I swear to you, this is how crazy we were on the Warner Roberts show. We had an elephant in the studio with a huge studio audience that day. Now that was a mistake, guys. I want to tell you that was a mistake. But we made a few. Oh, you know, but it, it seemed it. like a good idea at the time. Jim, any animals? No, just a two legged variety. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of those. yeah, I've got sort of the Jan story too of John Worler, uh, bless John him. John Worler. He was yeah. an herpetologist and he, yeah. he, he dropped a rattler in the middle of our, of oh. our set. <gasps> Uh, on the talk show, and the crew went ballistic. Uh -huh. uh, it was quite a hoot. He yeah. loved snakes. He liked oh, yeah. to do that. Oh, yeah, thing, man. Yeah. Well, I do want to say, though, that also when we mentioned some of the other things, we introduced them all with probably the show you would most remember. But all of you have worked around a variety of programs. And if you go to our website at HoustonPBS.org slash ACOTV, you can find full bios on all of our guests. So I wanted to just remind uh -huh. that because you also had a talk show mm -hmm. in addition to that and many other things. When we talk about, when we were looking at the clip a few minutes ago with Doug and we saw your partnership with Ron Stone, you've all had wonderful relationships and partners, and of course, Jan, you with Don Nelson. My TV husband. Your TV husband for many yeah. years. When I started in this business a few years back, I had Doris Childress as my partner. And what I always like to tell the story, very similar to yours, is that initially we didn't quite pair up right. But in time, we came to love each other. I was there with the birth of her child, and things fixed themselves. You, you finally realized it's never going to be 
the Ernie show. Oh, it's not well, going to ever who's be here the now. Dylan Nelson show so. or the Jane Glenn show. <laughs> huh? What did you say? I said, look who's here now. <laughs> <But anyway. laughs> uh, now I stand corrected. So, Jan, tell me a little bit. Well, when uh, Don was already there when I got there. And so he was married with a child. I was single and on the roads, having a great time. He had a child. I had animals. So we're not going to we're not going to click. You know, we were co-producing. We didn't have a producer. We were the co-producers and the co-host. I thought we should do a lot of stuff with the single life and with exercise. He thought he should do something with cooking and the married life. And so for uh, how many, how long, Doug, did we fight? Was it four years? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, we'd, we would scream and yell at each other about what we thought was important. And then one, one day we just realized we're just wearing ourselves out. It's never going to be his show, never going to be my show. And so we decided, okay, let's just call it the Good Morning Houston show like it is and work together. Yeah. And now he sat just like Doug is sitting this, for 14 years this close. He knew more about me and I knew more about him, just like you did, uh, than anybody else in the world. And so to this day... He's got a lot on me, and I've got a lot on him, <laughs> <laughs> and so we're you best keep it, friends. You so keep it, it all out. working out because you both have stuff on each other, right? Yes. So it's yes. here that Absolutely. brings you together. And pictures. Well, you know, we tell those little stories, and they're more like little anecdotes about our careers. But actually, what I find is that this television community is very close-knit, and that people, for the most part, all seem to get along between stations, between shows. Did you all find that to be the same? Then, yeah, absolutely. I, I, don't, I don't find it to be as, as much now, though, but of course I'm you know, part of the old group. But uh, when we started, first of all, too, we had a lot of local ownership, which meant a lot. Same thing in radio. Uh, and people that I, I tend to think cared more about the community. Mm. Um, we did things together. There would be a softball tournament for a, a, a police widow. That's Everybody right. that was not on the air shift at that hour was there. Mm -hmm. uh, then the stations were going, if it ain't our party, you can't go. So the city, I think, really suffered by a lot of that. Certainly we've got friends in the business, but the, the social aspect is not like it was, and I think the good that was done for the community is not like it was. It's just not. Uh, I mean, the, the destruction derby in the Astrodome, 20 years. We had mm -hmm. 60, 70 on-air people out there trying to kill each other in cars and laughing and having a wonderful time. <laughs> that was a great We've got day. standing room only in the dome for people to come watch us do that silly stuff. Uh, but it meant a lot. We had the opportunity to be ourselves uh, on, our, on our programs. We really did, and what you saw was real. And unfortunately, uh, I mean, these days, uh, except for Wardo, who you know just celebrated 45 years on 13, uh, it's not the same uh, personality. It's not somebody who is a real journalist reader. You've got the rating thing going, so you got to have the the hottie traffic girl and the uh, the uh, uh, maybe kinky weather guy, and a couple of them are here. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but you look at it, you know, here's the handsome guy, here's the this, here's the that, and it's kind of a rating thing. But you don't know these people like you knew these people, or that you mm -hmm. knew Stoney, or that you know Ward. It's, it's just not there, and it's very sad. Well, there seemed back there to be an opportunity to get to know the personalities yes. behind, behind their presence yep. on air. Talking about relationships, we have a little bit for Jan from uh, you and Don. Uh -huh. It's not the greatest quality, but Did we got it. Did you get this from me, or is this from the sta uh, oh, station? I don't know where we got it from. Let's just take Donna a look and see what we got. What yeah, right. <laughs> Good morning, Houston. It's time to find out what's happening in our Houston area. Don Nelson and Jan Glenn have news and information important to you and your family. Doug Brown's weather will help you plan your day. Now, good morning, Houston. Teaching handicapped children, virtually the same age. It's a big thing going on, very successful, and we're going to talk to some of our young teachers in just a second. Good morning, I'm Don Nelson. And I'm Jen Glenn, and there's something like 60 students that teach over 400 special children. I hate, when you talk to some of these young people in a moment, you're going to realize that they are well above us all, probably as, right now at their age, and intellectually, and they love it. See, look, he loves oh, yeah, it already. See, he's already <laughs> seen it. He's talking about the commercials. He's already yeah. seen the commercial, and he knows all yeah. the kids, and so <laughs> don't talk about <laughs> what I've got no, on, Don. No, zoom, zoom in, guys, real oh, quick. Oh, come on. Look at these. No, you can you start doing this. You I'm going to start rattling my quarters. These are stimulated quarters, okay? All right. There we go. Now, you I have to sit real still today because I'm driving Alan Miller, our audio man. We'll probably yeah. get a phone call that you're trapped and you're stuck in a, a soda pop machine somewhere. Look, you ever need a quarter today? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, He's yeah, such a you're welcome to it. <laughs> 
I mean no disrespect when I ask this question. After uh -huh. seeing that clip, you are the number one rated local program <laughs> across the country. See, America is beautiful. You <laughs> can accomplish anything in America. I was hoping for one of the workout videos. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was it, do you think, that made that show so successful? I have no idea. Well, first of all, we had such a great time doing it. Yeah. We had a ball. It was a party. And just like Harold was talking about, there, was, there really wasn't any structure. We could be ourselves. I mean... We could do anything that we wanted to. Nobody was on us every day about how we, how we could project ourselves or whatever. So I guess because we were having so much fun that feel, people could feel it. I would like to say, though, you mentioned the exercise segment. I did have a huge following in Huntsville. And I had a <laughs> oh, I know where huge this is going. <laughs> group of prisoners. They didn't have anything to do in Huntsville but watch Good Morning Houston every morning. So I was always a little bit nervous, you know, when I would get these phone calls, not phone calls, but, but fan, fan mail, yeah. that they were going to come by the station and take me out for coffee. Yeah. As soon as they got out. <laughs> yeah. Warner, right. how are you doing over in Huntsville? Very popular over there, too. <laughs> oh, the letters I got. Yeah. Talk to me about some, some of the fan mail. mail. <laughs> oh, the fan mail. Uh, we had the greatest, greatest audience. I called them friends instead of fans because they were really loyal. They were with us. You know, they just loved the show. I loved them. I loved the crew. We had the best crew in the world. Al Futnick, you remember, Smitty. Tom Smith, and uh, of course Terry Hartman was the producer on the show when we went on the air, and it was just a family. Yes, because your mother was your And my, your mother, my <laughs> mother cooked all the time, and she was everybody's favorite uh, yeah. guest, really. And so we, we wanted every celebrity in the world that was coming to Houston, and we got them because all get... the friends helped us. We're going to get the celebrity in one era second. That was kind of a golden age for people publicizing the arts. You had Warner's <laughs> show, you had Good Morning uh, Houston. Houston, there was also Catherine Blissard over on That's Channel right. 2, Joanne, right. mm -hmm. of course, yeah. uh, King on Channel 11, Mary Jane Vanderbilt on 39, That's and they right. all That's right. were welcoming uh, the arts and it the visiting like the celebrities 80s. who were here. It was in the 80s. That's when you had everybody yeah. coming in either with an exercise tape or they had a book, mm -hmm. a book, or, or, or a charity appearance. It mm -hmm. just seemed like everybody from MGM. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I'm going to get to all the celebrity stuff in one second, <laughs> but before we do, let's just take a taste of the Warner Roberts show. How about that? Taste of the Warner Roberts show was this. We decided before we went on Terry and Al and I that what I wanted to do and they agreed with it totally was to help somebody in some way yeah. use this in use television is the greatest way in the world to help somebody I, I'm laughing to myself because I know the clip we're about to show and that might oh. not fit exactly <laughs> not what you were this. hoping but here's a look at that. the Warner Roberts show <laughs> Then a very special guest star today that I didn't realize was going to be here, but he hopped right up beside me on the set. My good friend Nikki. Hi, darling. Hi. I'm glad you're back. Hi. And you, uh, I Thank guess, you. Have, have taken a lesson from your dad and just hopped up here and put your own microphone on. Of course, your dad is our, our floor manager.